Welcome to the Reading for the Glory podcast. I'm your host, Zach Kendrick, editor of Reading for the Glory. Reading for the Glory exists to help followers of Jesus think biblically about books. For more information, please visit readingfortheglory.com. This episode is brought to you in part by Airbender LLC. For our listeners in the Birmingham, Alabama metro area, Airbender is the HVAC company to call for quality and reliable residential heating and cooling services. Airbender is a BBB accredited company that offers the complete suite of HVAC repair and installation services. To request your free estimate, call 205-603-9306 or click the link in today's show notes. Airbender LLC, keeping you comfortable in all seasons. Today on the podcast, I am excited and honored to be joined by Dr. Alicia Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is an associate professor of history at Baylor University in Waco, Texas. She has previously served as the editor of Christian History Magazine and has taught at the University of Dubuque Theological Seminary. She spent a year as a fellow at the Center for the Study of Religion at Princeton University, and she's the author of The Christian Century and the Rise of the Protestant Mainline, Margaret Mead, A 20th Century Faith, and most recently, Turning Points in American Church History, How Pivotal Events Shaped a Nation and a Faith. Uh, Welcome to the Reading for the Glory podcast, Dr. Kaufman. Thanks, Zach. I'm glad to be here. And we are excited to have you on. I am a self-professed history nerd. Okay. And uh, but I'm also not just a history nerd. I am a a church history nerd. And so I'm not I'm not as you know well versed as you and others. I'm sure. But but mixing these two things of history and and the church, particularly American history, is one of my favorite. Um, topics and and things to study. So I have biographies of founding fathers and presidents and, and all that stuff, but I also have biographies and histories of church leaders and theology and that sort of thing. So this is this really melds together two of my favorite topics. So I'm very excited to have you on today. Great. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So for our listeners, if this is a two hour long podcast, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We're just get going. Let's go. Well, um, the the purpose of our conversation today, if if you can't already tell, is to discuss Dr. Kaufman's newest book, Turning Points in American Church History. But before we do that, uh, we like to ask all of our first time guests a few icebreaker questions. Are you good with that? I will do my best. All right. Well, we always start with an easy one, uh, and that is, where did you grow up? Mostly Upland, Indiana. Um, there's a little Christian college there in an ice cream store and some softball diamonds, and that's about it. <laughs> All right. Did you say the Christian college is in the ice cream store? It's near the ice cream oh, okay. store. I'm sure <laughs> at great. any given time, there are a lot of <laughs> faculty and students also at Ivanhoe's, but yeah, they're down the street from each other. I gotcha. Gotcha. What is your favorite color? Duke blue. Duke. So not Baylor green. Uh, it's growing on me, but okay. yeah, I have a prior loyalty to Duke blue. Yeah. So you, well, then, then that brings us to the next question. What, what's your favorite sport? Do you pull for Duke or Baylor or both? Um, in co- I'm, I am a pretty big college basketball fan. Um, at the time of our recording, I have my brackets posted on my office door because growing up in central Indiana, all the teachers always had their March Madness brackets posted. Um, when push comes to shove, I will root for, for Duke over Baylor still. Yeah. Well, since you were talking about ice cream just a minute ago, this leads to the other question that we like to ask. What's your favorite food? I teach food history, so I feel like I should pick something really elaborate, but it's not going to, gosh, uh, croissants. My daughter makes amazing croissants. Yeah. I I like croissants. They're good. So this might be a tough question, but because we always stump people on this one and I, I didn't think it would be tough when I wrote it several months back, but it it seems to stump people. What is your favorite hobby? Hiking with my bird app. Hmm. So like to go birding, like, are you a birder? Well, I am, I'm a, I'm a bird listener more than a bird watcher. (laughs) Okay. Cause I have the, the Merlin app. And so you hear a bird and it will tell you what bird you're hearing. And it's just Ah. like magic. I love it. I need to download that because I always, 
I'll hear a bird and I'll be like, oh, that's a whippoorwill. And my wife's like, no, I don't think that's a whippoorwill. <laughs> so maybe the I need to The app will that. tell you. There you go. I have that app that tells you if a plant is poisonous or not, which has been helpful because I've had poison <laughs> ivy. So maybe I need to get uh, get the bird app too. Yeah, I don't think there are poison birds, but I just no. I just find it really nice to know when I'm hearing something what that's it is. Right. That's right. To, maybe they have like a snake app too. So since there are poisonous snakes, so yeah, I don't know if there's a. There probably there seems like there's an app for anything anymore, yeah, right? That's right. That's right. So you've written a couple of books. Um, what is your favorite one that you've written so far? Oh, they're all really different. Um, I I like the Turning Points book a lot. <laughs> that possibly my favorite was the Margaret Mead. That was the most unexpected, and everything about her life and that research was constantly unexpected. Day to day working on it, I didn't know what rabbit trail I was going to have to go down for some footnote. So that was that was a lot of fun. There you go. And then the last question we like to ask um, is, so besides the Bible, what is your favorite book to read or that you've ever read? That's harder than the food. That's much harder than the food. Oh, goodness. I really like classic uh, early 20th century mysteries. So I could go with like a Dorothy Sayers, Gaudy Night. That's a, that's a good one. But it does depend on my mood, what I really want to read. Yeah. I think people that are, are readers, that's the case. I mean, there's some that, that have favorite books that just point, yeah, yes, this is my favorite book. But I think people that are, are true bookies, uh, like the different different flavors for different moods and different times of the year. So yeah, yeah. I, agree, I agree with that too. Well, that ends the uh, get to know you round. So thank you for those questions. Those are always fun. And as we turn to our conversation about your new book, Turning Points in American Church History, we always like to, to start by reading a passage of scripture that kind of ties into what we're going to be reading. And I struggled with this one, picking it. And the reason I'm picking it is not to say that this verse is tying into American history, but it leads into our first question. Okay. And, um, and so I think it's, it's pertinent and um, it, it, it ties into you know, American exceptionalism and and into Christian nationalism even a little bit. So I don't want to get too top hot topic there at the front, but uh, but it, 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 and so it, it hopefully you'll understand it once I read it. But it's coming from Matthew chapter five and verses fourteen and six uh, fourteen to sixteen. This is Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm not misapplying, for any listener, I'm not misapplying this verse to American history, but hopefully you'll bear with us as we launch into the conversation. So it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and honor your Father in heaven. I think often that verse, especially a city on a hill, gets misapplied to America in particular. I think of Ronald Reagan, um, who who called America a shining city on a hill. Um, And I I once heard, uh, I believe it was um, American historian John Meacham. Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. I think he had this quote that somebody said uh, to Mrs. Reagan years later that said, um, you know, the word shining is not in the Bible. It's just a city on a hill. And how, how, how did, uh, how did he, you know, improve on the Bible? And he, she said something to the effect of, Oh, Ronnie could always do something like that. And so it, it, it's, it shows this uh, skewed view of American history and um, applying it as like manifest destiny and, and all those things that just come swirling in when you think about mixing church history and American history. So how do you think this passage, um, even though it's, it's a skewed understanding, fits our perception of America and American history? Yeah, that um, obviously comes from the Bible. It was also used by uh, Puritan lay leader John Winthrop, uh, 1630, the beginning right. of the English Puritan migration. He gave this speech on this ship that has the allusion to the city on the hill. Um, and I mentioned that, although I quote a different part of the speech because it's really interesting um, 
the way it, it, it talks about wealth and sharing and also what kind of endeavor this country is going to be. Um, it has a lot of different ideas in it that almost seem like they wouldn't go together. Like some of them seem very conservative and some of them seem very progressive by the labels that would be added much, much later. Um, like you said, the Manifest Destiny, the American exceptionalism, those have been animating ideas through a lot of American history. Why um, settlement would move from the East Coast to the West Coast, why it was okay to get rid of anybody, any of the Native peoples who were in the way, why during the Cold War, we thought that it was good for us to export our economic order and our political order and make as much of the the world. Um, I remember growing up, I, I was learning geography during the Cold War. And so the world maps where there were all the red and pink color countries that were allied with the Soviet Union on all the dark blue and lighter blue countries would all, would all be like our sphere of influence. And then there's these other countries that we didn't know what color to make yet. I learned much more recently that, that the City on a Hill speech and idea wasn't present throughout American history, that that speech was lost to historians for a couple hundred years after 1630. Even now, historians aren't sure whether the speech was ever given or published at the time. It wasn't like all American Christians were always talking about that. It got rediscovered in the mid 20th century by um, a scholar, Perry, Mil Perry Miller, who was more of an um, English literary scholar, and using this idea as to interpret the American mind that was that was very popular in the mid 20th century to, to think about what was the American mind, and he took it back to the Puritans. So the, the speech was rediscovered, that phrase started to be used a little bit like um, by John F. Kennedy. But then, yeah, it was absolutely Reagan who made it a big part of how he then re-narrated American history as if that idea and those words had always been present. Where, I mean, kind of, kind of yes, kind of no, American exceptionalism that European Christians got it wrong, it being like God's will for the world. And um, European Christians moving to this new continent, we're finally going to get it right and show the rest of the world how it's done. That idea you can find lots of examples of. Yeah, and I think that uh, very much explains our current moment in American history. Um, and um, so, but the point of this conversation isn't necessarily to talk about the present, it's to talk about the past. And But I just thought it'd be helpful to start there. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that are running through uh, current American culture is is seen in your book. The seeds of that are um, are all throughout your book, whether it is slavery and racism or the treatment of natives, uh, treatment of Catholics, um, you know, various uh, things that have gone on through American religious history um, that... Um, are still present today. And so I just thought it'd be helpful to start there, mm -hmm. but we're going to, we're going to work our way backwards um, and go into history. And, you know, often when we think about American history and I, you know, I was one of those kids that just latched onto history and loved it. But so many people, they don't like it because it's all about dates and names and places. And so when we think about it, you know, we think about American history, specifically American history, we think about it in regards to pr predominantly politics. Mm -hmm. You know, we think about presidential eras. And, you know, when you think about, when I think about World War II, I think FDR. When I think the 80s, you think Reagan. Uh, when you think the 60s, you think JFK. When you think 1800s, if somebody just says 1800s America, I immediately go to Lincoln, even though he was only like a short period of of American history there, but, um, and, you know, and then somebody says American revolution, you think George Washington and all these others. So, um, but what was it like for you as you wrote this book to view American history, not just through political and, um, dates and movements and wars and that sort of thing, but through a religious and theological lens? Yeah, it was, it was really useful for me when I came to write this book that I have taught both sort of basic U.S. history survey classes as a member of a collegiate history department, and then um, also church history surveys as a seminary um, faculty member. So I was especially drawn 
for structuring the book to trends and ideas and, and people that came up in both of those survey classes, the sort of basic outline of U.S. history, how did we get to where we are, and um, the, the church history. And there I had to teach all the way. I had to start with early and medieval every fall, and then I had to do Reformation through modern Europe every spring. And anything that, that came up on, on both of those timelines, and I could really see, okay, this is definitely important. You can't, uh, the hinge point of U.S. history is still the Civil War. You can't have a U.S. history survey without the Civil War. You can't talk about American Christianity without the Civil War either. So especially, there are other things that were identified as turning points in the book for reasons that we can get into. But the ones that were, that would come up in both of those teaching contexts those were the ones that I that I put into my table of contents first. Like we absolutely have to talk about this. Yeah, and I find it interesting. You you start your book prior to to 1620 and the and the landing of the Mayflower, and we attribute to probably apocryphally the pilgrims and the first Thanksgiving and all that. Um, but you begin your book in and actually not 1620 but 1588 with the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Why, why did you think this was a good starting place to begin your history of American church history? Yeah, that's a it's a real quirky choice. I understand. Part of it was coming from that seminary context. That semester class was Reformation in Europe all the way through. U.S. And so some of the what aspects of the European past were still relevant for early American history? How were some of the um, like armed conflicts in early American history just kind of offshoots of European wars? How did European theological developments come to the side of the Atlantic or not come to the side of the Atlantic? That was that was part of it. I also from the teaching the U.S. survey so much happened in the lands that are now the United States before white English-speaking Protestants got here. There was all kinds of Spanish colonial activity. There was French colonial activity. We, The borders of this country could have been completely different. The standard language of these places could have been completely different. Things that we take as as given, of course, the United States would be the shape that it is on the map. And of course, it would be predominantly white Protestant English speaking. We're actually contingent. It could have been otherwise. It could have gone a different way. So starting with something unusual outside these borders um, also enabled me to to communicate. It's not a, a recent and weird development to have, say, a lot of Spanish speakers in the United States. No, they were here before the English speakers were. Yeah, yeah, you're right, and and even a lot of uh, I lived in New Orleans uh, for a time, and 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 the Spanish um, were were some of the first settlers of New Orleans. There's a big Spanish influence in New Orleans itself, and you think French and 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 um, Cajun and all that, but um, but but there's there was definitely a, a Spanish influence in New Orleans as well. So um, yeah, you're right. The the Spanish were. We're here first um, in, in many respects. And so, um, yeah, that's interesting how that, that is a hinge point for uh, church history in, in, in the American, uh, what was the American colonies in the now United States. Um, so chapter two, you talk about religious freedom and Roger Williams and, um, you know, religious freedom has been a hot topic in American history throughout. Um, And it's still a very hot topic, um, especially among some political groups. And, and I think rightly so. Um, But, you know, oftentimes we were, we were taught or at least in growing up in a Christian subculture um, or loosely affiliated to, um, you know, conservative politics, which is married to a Christian subculture, um, that, you know, this country was founded on Christian principles for the sake of religious freedom. Is that a right way of seeing this or, or how should we, we see, um, those, those early settlers in New England and, and what they were trying to accomplish when they came over here? Yeah, I, I usually teach this as um, the the English Puritan settlers who were just one fairly small group among lots of groups that were, were coming from Europe at this time. They sought the freedom to be very strict. Hmm. It's not the kind of religious freedom that 
would I think make the most sense to 21st century Americans that that freedom is mostly individual and freedom um, we think of it as freedom from rules rather than primarily freedom to make rules. And mm. this was a small, intensely communal group who thought that English Protestants were too lax. Um, they didn't preach long enough and there weren't enough requirements for how often people had to attend church. And there wasn't enough communal oversight by male religious leaders um, policing everybody's morality. And that God wanted that. And England wouldn't let them set up their perfect society the way they wanted to. So they came over here and sought the freedom to be very strict. So it is freedom, but probably not what you think of as freedom, religious or otherwise. So, so were they the first Christian nationalists, at least in America? Um, <laughs> <laughs> quite possibly. There's scholars debate whether it was a theocracy or not. Most early American scholars would say, well, well, it wouldn't. It wasn't because it was civil magistrates. There, there was a, a delineation of civil and religious authority. But of course, to be a civil magistrate, you also had to be a white male churchgoer. Right. So was there really that much daylight between the religious authority and the civil authority? Um, we had people in the cult sort of revolving door of pastor, civil magistrate, pastor, <laughs> civil magistrate. So there are some, in the past and present, some political systems that are even more governed by clergy, like Iran or something. Um, but yeah, the, the, the separation of civil authority and church authority was pretty faint in Puritan hmm. New England, I would say. Hmm. Yeah, definitely didn't get the separation of church and state idea from them. No, Roger Williams, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Some of the deist founding fathers who wanted church leaders to be out of the business of statecraft. Yeah, that, that's yeah. where we were getting that. Yeah, and for a very good reason. Well, they, they knew what Europe had been like, and they didn't want right. to do that again. It, it right. was always harder for Roger Williams or any of those guys to figure out what they wanted instead and then to mm. actually build it and have it work. Mm. Sounds like a lot of modern politics, too. <laughs> Well, yeah. Um, even at a like a university institutional level, it's it's fairly easy to be like, mm, that's not working. Okay, well then, how would you fix it, both in in theory and in practice? And that's just always going to be a lot harder. Well, you can't tell the story of American history, even even social history, um, without at least a mention. I know even even in um, you know textbooks, it mentions the the Great Awakening. Um, which had huge impacts on American culture, even though we were, um, you know, just the colonies at the time. Uh, we weren't even officially founded as what is now the United States. Um, and you, you discuss how this moment in American history was, was when evangelicalism first took hold in what's now the United States. So from that perspective, um, why is this an important turning point uh, in American history? Yeah, um, there is scholarly debate about that. That's what we do. Um, we debate stuff. And I, I tried to present some of that in the book, even though this isn't a book primarily for historians who are, are looking to make those arguments one way or the other. Um, this was one of the areas that I felt like the scholarship was so unsettled that, it, to be fair, I had to present some multiple sides on it. And there are people like my former Baylor colleague, Tommy Kidd, who would say the Great Awakening, um, the George Whitfield preaching tours, the um, idea of sort of individual empowerment and choice in salvation, segueing into individual empowerment and choice in democracy and therefore revolution. He sees those things as being very tied together. There are other scholars who would say, um, actually, Great Awakening had a big influence on what would later be seen as the evangelical tradition, but the political side was responding more to um, economic changes and particular uh, leadership uh, coming out of out of the UK and other um political philosophies that were that were swirling. And I, I don't I'm not an early Americanist. That's not the period that I'm a, a specialist in. So I don't I don't have a, a side to pick in that. 
certainly the I, the Evan, what I would think of as the evangelical tradition, that also hugely contested. What do you mean by that? And who is it? And right. does it right. really go back? I think that taking it back to the the pro-revival factions in the era of the Great Awakening. Oh yeah, was there even a Great Awakening? Also debated by scholars. This, we just go round and round on this stuff. There were revivals, no doubt. Was there a particular concentration of them that was so big or so unique to be worthy of a designation of the first Great Awakening? And then was there a second Great Awakening? That's even more controversial. You can't even find any agreement on what decade or decades the Second Great Awakening might have happened in, um, which for historians that sends off on us on all kinds of specific debates. But the idea that there were great awakenings and that those were punctuating moments in American history, which usually goes then with the idea that we should be looking for building for the next one, whether or not that idea that it is it is normal to have major cyclical revivals in American history, whether or not that is true when you go back to the original sources around the time of what we would now call the Second Great Awakening, they weren't writing about, remember that first one in the 1730s and 1740s? Like that kind of naming these events did not happen in the past. That happened much later. But even that is interesting, that a lot of American Christians believe that this was very important in history and is also an ongoing feature that we can experience or, or look for. So I know that's a super long and complicated answer, but um, these are really lively discussions in the field. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's definitely more um, historical credence for the First Great Awakening, um, especially more looking at it from a religious standpoint as a true movement of God and the Holy Spirit rather than um, the Second Great Awakening, which is even more contested theologically as to whether or not those were truly a movement of, of God or if they were just, you know, celebrity preachers trying to build an audience or something like that. So it's also just contested. Like, when are we talking about and where are we talking about? Um, and how would you know it when you see it? And why are you counting you, the, the kinds of within the church historians or, or historically minded uh, church leaders? Um, are you counting that LDS, that Mormons? Are you counting Millerites? Mm-hmm. Are you counting mm-hmm the um, various kinds of Catholic renewal movements, usually they're not. Right. Usually they have a very specific idea about what they're mm-hmm. counting, which from an internal church perspective, there certainly can be theological reasons for that. But we historians are always like, yeah, but you're making interpretive choices here. You're not just mm-hmm. saying this is what happened in the past. Let's talk about the interpretive choices. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. And I think, you know, going to the First Great Awakening, I think there's definitely... Um, some lasting things that that occurred, in, you know, in in American history that that kind of still pushed forward, even um, because a lot of that was happening in New England, which um, is now, in, you know, increasingly less religious in in any capacity, um, and I think that has an impact on American history too. Uh, what would you speak to that as far as the the um, the impacts culturally it had on the, the first one, uh, the first Great Awakening had on American history, and um, yeah, as far as it immediately, and then also the decline of Christianity in those areas. I don't know if I'll get all the way to the decline. Let me see how I would answer that. Um, depending on the context that I've been teaching in. It has either been more or less natural to segue from historical conversations to the like, well, but what was right and what was true and what was biblical, because I may have um, people in that space who have really different answers about that. The um, Dubuque University Dubuque Theological Seminary had Presbyterians and Methodists, um, mostly, and those denominations now there are like more amenable to revival and less amenable to revival um, or like the kind of heartfelt piety or even like an evangelical orientation, that was not something that everybody in the room agreed on. Um, and so that wasn't really the discussion. They could they could have that in other classes in seminary. That wasn't what, really what we were going to have in mind. Often in my class, we would end up looking at some historical development in terms of, okay, what problems did this solve? 
and what problems did this cause? <laughs> And the first great awakening, if we if we want to accept that nomenclature, 1730s, 1740s, um, there were complaints that the churches were dead and legalistic, um, that the fervor of earlier generations that had come from Europe at great personal cost to start these towns and churches by the second, third, fourth generation, some of that um, fervor had died out. There seemed to be some immoral behavior. So the revival will get people fired up again. It'll get them excited to go to church. It'll get these churches growing that maybe had not been growing at the same rate. Um, so admitting that the, the solves problems, causes problems is a very simplistic formula, but but taking that under consideration, okay, we, we've, we've solved the churches are, are dead. People don't care about it. It doesn't seem to be affecting their lives problem. And now we've caused problems, including now individual believers are taking it upon themselves to determine whether their clergy are Christian enough and fired up enough. And if those individual believers don't think so, well, you're, you're splitting congregations, they are ousting pastors, they are starting new churches, this is dividing families, this is dividing towns, this is a much smaller again it wasn't that long before that they were setting up this tightly communal society which also has its own positives and negatives but injecting that kind of individualism and uh, tests for whether other believers are getting it right or not well that causes new problems why do we have hundreds thousands of different denominations and non-denominational churches in this country um Again, that's a, that's a whole nother debate. <laughs> but th that solves some problems. Like right. people can find a church in a, in a community big enough. You can look around until you find one that really works for you and your family. That's that solves a problem. And it causes the problems of, okay, so now you have a town with 100 churches that all believe that the other ones aren't really Christian. <laughs> so they can't work together very well to, you know, do communal work. And they're, they're wasting their energy fighting each other. So, yeah, it's. Um, that's sort of how I would see that some of that, that there were parts of, especially upstate New York in the 19th century that just got known as the burned over district. There had mm -hmm. been so many revival fires. People couldn't decide what church to go to anymore. They were just exhausted and kind of gave it up. Which then ends up with, you were talking about the decline and, um, you know, the empty buildings and, and that sort of thing. So that you see in those areas even today. Evangelical, interdenominational, reformational. At Beeson Divinity School, these core values are the foundation on which we prepare students for a vocation in ministry. Based in Birmingham, Alabama, our graduate degree programs are offered in person and are strengthened by faculty mentoring, small class sizes, and a vibrant community. Take the next step in preparing for ministry at Beeson Divinity School. And speaking of um, not thinking that other people are Christian, um, this leads to in, in chapter six, because um, you know, most of American, or at least, you know, I grew up evangelical um, and, and still still am evangelical, but so often church history is even even so. I grew up in the Baptist tradition, so even even growing up in that tradition. I thought that church history, even even going back to early church history, um, really was all about how getting to the you know ultimately you get to the Reformation and then you know uh, and now here we are with the Protestants and we're the true church and all that sort of thing. So so my growing up, my understanding of church history was very limited to okay, what does early church history speak to my own tradition today? And it does. It didn't include a major air, a swath of of true church history that was Catholic, um, and I think in American church history, especially when you think about you know American Christians and the Church in America, nobody really includes the Catholics in that. Um, 
But yet the, there is, you know, Catholicism and the Catholic Church in the United States is still a major force. Um, and um, it it's it still has had cultural impacts. You know, our current president at, at the time of this recording, and even when this podcast will come out, still a Catholic, Joe Biden is our second president uh, to be a Catholic. First one was John F. Kennedy in the 1960s, and that was hugely controversial. Um, that, you know, this guy's going to basically, you know, give the keys to the kingdom, if you will, to the Pope, right? And so he's going to sell out America and all that. So first off, why do you, why is Catholicism basically not, why doesn't it get, has not gotten as much press? And I'm so glad you included it in, in your book. But why do you think it has not gotten as much press in American history, but but even can you speak to the importance that Catholicism has had on Christianity in America? Yeah, there are a lot of answers to that. So I'm going to focus on sort of how it ended up situated the way it did in my book. I, I am a Protestant. I started writing this when I was at the um, University of Dubuque Theological Seminary. So I was at a Protestant seminary. Um, the first thing I did when I thought about writing this book was call my mentor, Mark Knoll, author of the Turning Points, the, the whole church history survey, and ask him, okay, so if you were doing one for American church history, what are some of the dates? He's a Protestant historian. So th there's all kinds of reasons why that's just what came to mind. Protestants have been the most um, politically prominent tradition throughout um, U.S. history since English colonization, obviously before that, when it was French and Spanish, it was um, it was Catholic. Um, so if you're if you're thinking in terms of who got to set the terms of debate, whose theological um, internal fights would spill out into the public more, it's it's been pretty overwhelmingly Protestant. Although the largest single denomination in the United States was Roman Catholic from about the 1840s on. Um, again, we think of it as like a JFK 1960s thing, mm -mm. 1840s, that it was a major presence. So that was part of why I wanted to have a sort of Catholic chapter earlier on, although it's silly in some ways to sequester Catholics out of the other story. For me, a lot of it, I have friends who do Catholic history. If I were a different person, I would have found ways to, to integrate it more. Often, American Catholic history was kind of on a different timeline than what the Protestants were doing because, especially of the history of sort of waves of immigration. So some of the things that American Catholic immigrants in the United States were dealing with in, say, the 1880s, um, being the, the first member of your family to come over here and try to find a foothold. Uh, Protestant families had done that in a completely different decade or a completely different century. So it was it was hard to talk about sort of th viewed from 30,000 foot trends of what politically prominent Protestants were doing vis-a-vis -vis American culture. And then be like, oh, and also Catholics were doing this completely other thing, only kind of at the same, like, if we're looking at the time period, Protestants and Catholics were doing very different things. If we're looking at the trends, this is sort of like what the first generation experiences, what the second, that's similar, but not happening at the same time. And so I ended up with a, a Catholic chapter that starts with the election of the, the bishop and then goes all the way into the early 20th century. Because it was kind of like, here's their arc and timeline. It's not going to map onto everything else. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can see it. And then we're not going to hear from them for a while, except as victims of anti-Catholic violence. And yeah, that's what you get when you ask a Protestant to write your book. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I think from from speaking of my for myself, I, um, you know, I've begun to appreciate even church history more by um, just in general by recognizing that um, there was a lot fifteen hundred years of of church history that occurred uh, prior to the Reformation. And so, and they were Catholic or some form of Eastern Orthodox. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, we, for, for good or for ill, we, you know, this, I mean, we're Christians because of the Catholic church, 
And so, um, you know, they, they deserve to be studied and learned about. And, and those who came before us in, in church history, who passed down the gospel, um, for the majority of history were Catholic. And so I think, um, we definitely have to, to have that discussion. Second part of that question was what, um, what impact on American society and American culture and American history have the, has the Catholic church had, or is it, has it been different because they're the political, um, that their political leanings or political, um, action was different, uh, in comparison to, uh, Protestants. Yeah. There are a couple ways to think about that. A lot of these, immigrant communities, and this isn't unique to Catholics, but um, just because of the way that groups came at different times, they often were not English speaking. Um, And so they became communities, parishes, subcultures, where there was a lot of really interesting and important work going on inside that other people, even possibly other Catholics didn't know about. So there's Irish Catholic history, and there's Italian Catholic history, and there's Slavic Catholic history. A lot of my colleagues who do Catholic history, like that's they're really looking at the, the ethnic traditions and the the rich enculturation and the material culture of that. Again, it's it's harder to then fit that into an overall narrative that still has the U.S. history survey wars and presidents in the back. That's just the Irish Catholics went to war. It, it's not that these things are completely not connected, but it's hard narratively, historically to connect them. At the same time, as as a large religious minority, the biggest single denomination from the 1840s on, often the Roman Catholic Church would push American political society to um, re-evaluate or re-articulate some of its assumptions. And, and some of these uh, fights come up and like, what do we mean by uh, moral education in public schools? Does it mean reading the Bible? Well, okay, which Bible? Because Protestants and Catholics don't use the same translation. And there's extra books in the Catholic Bible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the translation and, and the length of it is different. Or when kids are learning European history. Well, the way Protestants and Catholics narrate European history is very different because they were the antagonists there. Um, and Protestants, for all of our internal divisions, could assume, well, this is just what it was. This is what everybody thinks, right? And, and the Catholics were the larger religious minority. Um, American Jews have performed the same function um, more in the 20th century to be the ones raising their hair. They're like, um, yeah, but we're also here. And the legal framework, your alleged separation of church and state, your alleged constitutional principles, you're making them fit you and not the rest of us. So um, can we have a conversation about that? So that that is something that American Catholics have um, often been in the role of throughout American history. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, uh, that's so helpful. And so, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's helpful to understand that when you say American religious history, that includes a broader spectrum. But when you specifically say church history, um, I think it has to include the Catholics uh, and the Catholic, uh, the role of the Catholic Church in society. So I'm so glad you you included that. Um, and and I learned something too. There's a Catholic school here in my town called John Carroll uh, Catholic High School, and I just thought he was some guy from there, but did not realize that he was like the first Catholic bishop in America. So I learned something <laughs> myself. Yeah. Um, so we would be remiss not to uh, discuss, um, you know, so, you know, talk about the First Great Awakening, you can't talk about American history. And you you were talking about how the hinge point of American history is the Civil War. So we would be remiss not to, to talk about the issues that um, revolve around the American Civil War. And I'm going to couple that because you have a second chapter that talks about, towards the end of the book, um, that talks about um, the Civil Rights Movement. And so I'm going to put those two together here in one conversation. But, um, you know, like you said, you can't talk about American history without talking about the Civil War. Um, and I know there's debate on whether the Civil War was over states' rights or whatever, but ultimately slavery is at the heart of the Civil War. I mean, 
you're you're blind if you states rights to what to, to have right. slaves. You're, you're blind <laughs> if you don't if if you don't say that the Civil War was not fought over slavery. Um, and you know, in this story, we see a major paradox. Um, and you know, we could also, I guess, call it hypocrisy too. But so that the faith of slave owners was received and flourished by those they enslaved. I find that so fascinating. I just watched a PBS documentary on the black church by Henry Louis, Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, and he talked about that, how, how the slaves embraced in, in large portions uh, the, the faith of their slaveholder. And I found that so fascinating. So um, do you see this as a powerful display of, of, I won't say just the truth of Christianity, but or the, the powerful display of God's working uh, in, in American history? Um, or, or do you think there's something else going, going on there? There were other things going on. There were some early enslaved people trying to make the case, I think this is back in the 18th century, that if they were baptized as Christians and they couldn't be enslaved anymore. Um, that had been in some of the legal codes and enslavers quick rewrote those legal codes. They're like, mm, no, it doesn't mean that we can, we can enslave Christians if they're black. Sure. That's fine. Um, there's some like enslaved people being able to win favor from their enslavers by going to church with like, I wouldn't say that there there's no material reasons for why enslaved populations would have adopted Christianity, but I would also say that that, for me, falls way short of an explanation. You don't get the vibrant Black church traditions, both the secret church meetings at the at the risk of their lives, and the later Black church traditions through Reconstruction and after that as the, the absolute pillars of those communities. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get there just for this worldly, um, trying to, to make savvy decisions reasons. Um, I, I really do think that, that there has to be that the, that truths and grace and, uh, power and freedom that they found there were so meaningful that not just that they would use it to their advantage. It wasn't that at all. It was that they, they couldn't live without it. No, I, I totally agree. And, and you're right that uh, I would recommend that uh, documentary that I was mentioning. Um, I could put a link to it in our show notes, uh, PBS, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. Uh, so powerful. And um, it's, it's, it's so interesting that um, when you, I don't think that's the purpose of that documentary in particular. And, but even in your, your book, you talk, I guess a little bit about it, that it's like, you almost get the sense that the, um, the 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 slaves who embraced the Christianity are really the true Christian, <laughs> and not those who are enslaving them. Um, and that's, that was that's an such a insight. That, such a par- no, I was just sorry. saying that's such a paradox to me. It's so it's just so fascinating that. Um, and again, we can't judge anybody's heart, but um, it, it really does see that the, they embraced the best sides of. They saw past the hypocrisy of their slave owners and saw the Christ that they were preaching. Yeah. I, I was saying that a, a grad school friend of mine, Sarah Rubel, who has done a video um, adult church education curriculum on Christianity and race in the United States, which that came out in the, in the middle of when I was working on this book, I ended up working on this book for 10 mm-hmm. years. So a lot of things happened in the middle of it. Yeah. But she said that when she was putting together this curriculum, she got some pushback from white church goers saying, you're too negative on the church. All the, all the Christians are the bad guys in this. And she's like, um, there were black Christians in this story who were amazing. Like what, what does it say about the audience to think that if the white Christians are portrayed negatively, then it is somehow anti-church. No, recognizing that. Yeah. Often, often the, the, um, Heroes is too narrow, uh, too thin of a word for that. But the like the the really powerful witness, the people who you want to be putting up statues to rather than pulling down the statues of, um, were often Christians of of color. Mm-hmm. Many of them mm-hmm. um, black, some uh, Native American. Like in in yeah, I think you're right in a lot of ways that the 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 stronger, more honorable characters that come through in this narrative. Um, are the non-white Christians. 
Yeah. I, 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 yeah, it's just fascinating. And we could talk about that specifically for, for hours. Uh, and again, that, that documentary, um, but to couple that fast forward in history to the civil rights movement, um, that you talk about in chapter 12, um, they're definitely linked because you see the, proponents of Jim Crow and um, even members of the KKK, many of them were from my own tradition, Southern Baptist Convention, which just makes me bristle (laughs) when I think about that. Um, And yet they were, so here we have these Christians, whether they're KKK or just some other sort of, you know, Jim Crow supremacist, white supremacist type, um, proponent uh, committing violence against other Christians, burning their churches, uh, burning their homes, burning crosses in their yard. Um, And again, it just seems like these people who are quote unquote Christians are are not, again, can't church their heart, but the ones they're they're committing violence against are the true Christians here. It just, it just, it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to grapple with. And, um, but how do we as as Christians in this current moment, you know, and this this is still a hot topic in our culture today, how, how do we graf- grapple with the um, horrific uh, nature of, of, especially you talk about specifically in this chapter, the events of um, the 16th Street bombing here in Birmingham. I'm, I'm sitting um, not far, so I'm, a little south of Birmingham, um, so probably five miles from 16th Street or so. And I'm actually sitting much closer to where the men planned the bombing itself. Not, I'm probably a mile from the Cahaba River Bridge where they sat and under that bridge and um, planned those events. Um, how do we grapple with this? You know, Because for me, it's even though I didn't grow up in Birmingham, it's, I see it. I think about that every time I pass over that bridge. I think about those events. Um, how do we grapple with that um, as as modern Christians in America today? I, I think that white Christians, by and large, are just beginning to grapple with it. Um, I don't. I don't feel like I'm very far along that process myself. This chapter was originally planned to be about the March on Washington and the "I Have a Dream" speech because. That's the version of the civil rights movement that I learned as a white kid in central Indiana. Um, That was that was the plan. Um, And as I've mentioned before, I started this book when I was at the University of Dubuque and then I came to Baylor. And for tenure and promotion reasons, um, I wrote the Margaret Mead book for Oxford first and then came back around to finish this one. And 2020 and the assassination of George Floyd had happened in between. Um, and all of those protests. And I realized, which I'm a historian, I should have known this, but I realized then, no, the nice words are not, that's not the story. The violence was the story. And this chapter needs to be about that instead. And so I, I wanted it to come across as horrible. And I wanted it to come across as horrors perpetrated by white churchgoers. Um, because again, I'm a historian. I should have known that. That should have been first to mind. My black Christian friends, that's on their mental timeline. That's the, as I was going to some of the local events around, um, 2020 here in Waco, just the mental geography of the, the black residents of my town, this happened there, this happened there, not on my map at all. Um, and so I don't, I don't know what to do with that other than that needs to be the story and we need to sit with that. Hmm. No, I agree. I agree. And even just thinking, um, you're talking about that I have a dream speech, which is a major point in American history. Absolutely. Um, I mean, very prophetic. Um, call, drawing from the prophets of the Bible, Amos in particular. Um but just thinking about um, not just the, the bombing here, here in 16th Street, but his, his letter from the jail sitting right here, just again, 
probably five miles away. Um, and he's writing to white pastors in my city, which again, I didn't grow up here. So, uh, but it, it's still, when, when you think about it, it's still to me palpable because I imagine him writing to my church because it's predominantly white and, or, or other churches I've been a part of that are predominantly white. And it's just, you're right. This history happened right here. And, um, it's, it's, our city has done an amazing job of preserving it. There's a civil rights trail and it goes through the jail and, and 16th street and different things. So, um, I would invite listeners come to Birmingham and tour tour. It's very great. Um, and even they just, um, have just, um, re, um, renovated and refurbished the AG Gaston Motel where King and several of his colleagues would stay when they would come to Birmingham. And so that's a part of the trail as well. So um, this is an invite to come to Birmingham. You as well, Dr. Kaufman, come to Birmingham and and do the civil rights. I'll be there in October. All right, cool. The Conference on Faith and History is meeting at Sanford okay. in October. So a whole bunch of us will be there. Well, I would encourage you to, to do that civil rights trail. And um, when you're here and, um, uh, it's 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 very good, and so it's it, you're right. We, it's something we have to sit with, and I think um, it's okay to be like the friends of Job, who at least in the first part they just sat silent. I think too often we like to talk, but uh, and that's where the story of Job goes wrong for a while. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we need to sit and listen for a while. As we wrap up our time today, um, we can't not also talk about the other elephant in the room, which is, and we touched on it a minute ago, but the, the history of, of the native peoples of America uh, and American history um, and how they have been treated throughout history from the very beginning, even to the present day. Um, by and large, the impact of Christianity on the indigenous peoples um, was negative. Um, but can you speak to the side of American religious history um, that is this, like a, the positive reception of Christianity by um, natives? In some ways, it's um, there are parallels to the, the story of the enslaved people. Um, there were native and indigenous people from first hearing about Christianity who found truth in it, who adopted it, who accepted it into their belief system. Um, conversion was not as binary as often the, the white missionaries, particularly the Protestant missionaries, wanted it to be. Okay, this you now have a new religious identity. You also need to change the way you style your hair and change your dress and change your language and change your name. And Native peoples often found really powerful ways instead to maintain aspects of their identity and culture and also um, learn about and lean into the, the um, truths and practices of Christianity. In terms of negative impact, um, enslavement had all kinds of negative impacts, and I'm not trying to compare horrors, but one reason it was perhaps different for Native peoples, um, and this again goes back to the before the English colonization, 90% of the population of the Americas was wiped out within a century of first European contact. 90%. Wow. So anything that we are recording about Native indigenous history in the Americas is the remnant of that was ravaged by disease and violence. It is, it is just the tattered pieces of these nations and cultures in a lot of ways. And, and I don't want to then, they're not just people to pity, like they're, they're, there's strength and resilience and, and art and culture and amazing stuff there, but they were working at a serious disadvantage and, and that they, that native peoples too, some of them rejected Christianity. They said, I have seen who you are. I have seen what you do. And I want no part of that. And yet, again, against all odds, some of them said, no, I, I see truth there. I see beauty there. Um, I want to be part of a religious family with you all, <laughs> you all Christians who are doing these often horrible things and also sometimes truly trying to bring education and medicine and protection for the land. There, there are some heroic Anglo figures in this history who were trying to learn native languages, trying to protect native sovereignties and lands going with them as they were expelled from place to place. It, it's not 
all good, all, all bad in any way. Um, but yeah, that, that's another really hard story from the past. Um, and it, and it's not over. Um, when I taught the U S history survey, I very naively early on thought, well, in the first half, the, up to the civil war, I'll be teaching a lot about, um, native peoples, but then by the second half, like they're just not going to be there anymore, which is not true. <laughs> it's not true at all. They, they are still around and there's still a lot to learn from their ongoing existence as, as well as their history. Yeah. I think the moral of the story of these the conversation about Christianity and slave owners and those that they enslaved and, and even towards the natives is be like Jesus, <laughs> you know, uh, stop trying to build your little empire and just give, give people the good news and, but don't force it on them. <laughs> I think, uh, I think we have a lot to learn from those in our past that um, tried to force the faith rather than just merely share the faith. And so hopefully that's some. And couldn't see any difference between their ideas of civilization and the gospel, that the gospel meant petticoats for women. We mentioned before we hit record, but uh, Dr. Karen Swallow Pryor, she talks about that very much in her, her new book, The uh, Evangelical Imagination, and um, mm-hmm. regarding empire, regarding the role of men and women, and how a lot of that's more Victorian than it is Bible, and so fascinating. But yeah, I think um, I think you're right, and I think we would, we would do better to learn just to share the gospel and let it contextualize to people rather than force culture on, on them as well, so... So as we wrap up today, um, I have two more questions for you, and that is, how do you hope that your book will benefit those who read the book, both Christian and non-Christian? Yeah, I'm starting from a position of assuming that a lot of people who grew up in churches really don't know this story very well. And I assume that because that was me. Grew up in churches, went to a Christian college. It wasn't until after undergrad when I was editing Christian History Magazine and every quarterly issue was about some different person or or period in church history. And I was thinking, how did I never, how did I never learn this? Some of it was that 1500 years of, of Catholic and Orthodox history, but a lot of it wasn't even that. And I still hadn't learned it because it wasn't my particular denominational tradition or for whatever reason. Um, so I, I think that almost anyone who, who is a church goer, even, even a fairly knowledgeable one, there'll, there'll be stuff in here that they didn't know or they hadn't put together, they hadn't thought about, or they knew how it was taught to them 10, 20, 30 years ago and, and didn't realize that historians have taken another look at it, um, offered some new interpretations. So it's a way of, of understanding the world around us, the, the way, why things are the way they are. Um, that's, that's my overall orientation as a historian and particularly a, a specialist in the 20th century. Like how, how did we get to here? Um, how might it have been different? How might it be different even now? Um, there, there were paths not taken. There were minority reports, um, not just ethnic minority, but most American Christians super gung ho on say World War One, and then there was this small group saying, "No, that's just a war of empire, and it's really brutal, and let's not do that." There, there are um, voices within our own tradition that we might be able to go back and recover and be like, "Those folks were onto something." I don't have to reinvent critique of uh, militarism or nationalism now. It, it's been done before. There, there are resources that I can go back to. Um, I would hope that some. Christian readers would see that. Even uh, readers who are, especially in the United States, um, church history also helps explain the way that their world is the way it is, even if they don't go to a church. I think I mentioned a a story in the introduction when I was teaching world religions in America at Duke University to undergrads. And I asked the students, why did you take this class? It, It was an elective. And one student said, this Gothic chapel in the middle of campus freaks me out. And I just want to understand this whole thing better. So like I can live in the shadow of this cathedral. All Americans are in some ways living in the shadow of churches. And because of the huge impact of the United States globally, everyone in the world is kind of living in the shadow of American churches. And so whether readers outside churches would either say, hey, there's something interesting here that I would like to go see, or 
oh, well, that explains a lot. Any of those reactions I, I would welcome and hope that there's something in the book for readers from any of those perspectives. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I, there's so much we didn't touch on um, in the book. And um, so definitely encourage listeners to check it out. Um, our last question I have for you, uh, I'd like to end on this one, especially when we're talking to um, an author. And that is you're a historian, you're a professor. Uh, do you have any future uh, book projects in the works? Yes. I am working on the History of Religion News Service, which is the only religiously focused newswire service. It was founded in 1933 or possibly 1934, depending on which date you use. Uh, That's been a dream project of mine since um, the year I was at Princeton. I needed to find one picture to use in my first book, and I knew that it was in the Religion News Service archive in Philadelphia. So I went down from, from Princeton, and I discovered they didn't just have my one picture. They had 600 and some boxes of archival material of photos and documents pertaining to religion in the U.S. and around the world. And those boxes had been sitting in a basement since 1983. And hardly anybody knows what's in there, but it's amazing. So it's taken me this long in my career to really even get back around to that. And it's going to take a lot more years before I can write a book out of it. But yep, that's what I'm working on. History of Religion News Service. Oh, fascinating. Fascinating. Well, thank you, Dr. Kaufman, for joining us today on the Reading for the Glory podcast to uh, talk about your new book. Thanks so much, Zach. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I'm definitely glad to have this conversation. Like I said, there's so much we could have talked about, but I definitely encourage listeners to check out your book. We will be sure to have a link to Turning Points in American Church History by Dr. Kaufman in today's show notes. We hope you check that out. If you have a question, a comment, or would simply like to drop us a note, be sure to connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Threads, X, and Instagram. And you can also check us out on YouTube. Be sure to follow us to stay up to date on our latest articles, book reviews, and podcasts. If you'd like to contact us by email, you can write us at readingfortheglory.com slash contact. And if you'd like to support the ongoing work of the Reading for the Glory podcast or Reading for the Glory in general, you can uh, make a donation by clicking the support the show link in show notes, or you can visit readingfortheglory.com slash donate. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. That will help us out tremendously. And we look forward to having you join us again next time on the Reading for the Glory podcast as we think biblically about books. Thank you for listening to the Reading for the Glory podcast. If you enjoyed today's content, we would like to invite you to consider becoming one of our ministry partners. Our ministry partners help to support the ongoing ministry of Reading for the Glory which allows us to produce content such as our book reviews, our study series, and this podcast. For more information, please visit readingfortheglory.com partners. And thank you for your support.